I have to uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sosi. I couldn't um, ask for a more wonderful and generous, uh, kind introduction. I paid her to say all of that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I am very pleased to be here at uh, ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor School of College of Law. I appreciate the uh, invitation to speak. Um, and um, I especially want to thank Greg uh, Hill, the executive director of the legal, um, Indian Legal Program, Darlene Lester, and of course, uh, Patty uh, Ferguson Bonney um, <clears throat> for um, inviting me to be here. I'm just so, uh, so pleased, so glad, and honored uh, to uh, once again be here uh, at the uh, College of Law and to be a part of this lecture series. Um, I have to say at the outset that the uh, Indian law program is certainly well known nationally uh, as a national leader um, in education and uh, the field of federal Indian law. And over the years, I have very much valued my opportunity to work with the esteemed uh, law professors here um, in various matters, uh, Professor Sosi, uh, Professor uh, Bob Clinton, um, over here, uh, Bob Miller, Professor Miller, of course, uh, Professor, uh, Law Professor Kevin Gover, um, currently at the Smithsonian, uh, Patty Ferguson Bonney, um, most recently, as well as uh, Mr. Carl Artman. And, uh, I just have to commend the law school for such a wonderful uh, all-star lineup of uh, uh, Indian law professors as a part of the faculty of this uh, leading uh, ranking law school. And I'm just so glad to be here. I, I, I've been inspired by the scholarship, the innovation, and the leadership provided by this uh, Indian law program here at the university. And therefore, I, I, I personally feel it's very, very fitting uh, to present my very first uh, law school book lecture in support of my new book, uh, In the Light of Justice, uh, here at this law school. Um, this book is uh, fresh off of the press. It was released uh, last month uh, in August. And uh, we've done a domestic uh, book launching event uh, in June for it in New Mexico, as well as an international uh, book launching event in Fiji in the South Pacific. Um, and I'm now um, on a national uh, book lecture tour in support of this book and beginning right here in the Great Hall as it should be. <laughs> Um, but this book is about a brand new legal framework for defining Native American rights in the United States. It examines the landmark UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, which is an international um, instrument um, that creates a comprehensive human rights framework, a comprehensive human rights framework for indigenous rights of indigenous peoples worldwide. This declaration was approved by the UN or uh, in the year 2007, as Professor Sosi has said, um, and it was endorsed by the United States in the year 2010. Um, and so today there's 150 nations around the world that have endorsed this UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, it's the new order of the day, it seems to me. And so my book basically uh, examines this UN Declaration, the nature and uh, its contents and then it goes on to compare these UN human rights standards um, with existing US law and policy uh, to see how well our laws and policies here in the US stack up against these UN standards. Um, 
And then finally, this book urges our nation to undertake a social and legal movement to implement these UN standards into our existing laws and policies so that all of our laws and policies comply with or comport with each and every one of these UN standards. And I have to say at the outset that this book, I'm, I'm very in, indebted to um, uh, law professor uh, S. James Anaya, who's a professor of law at the University of Arizona um, College of Law, for writing the uh, foreword to this book. As you know, uh, this brilliant uh, indigenous lawyer is currently serving as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations. And in that capacity, uh, Professor Anaya is uh, the, the UN official uh, primarily responsible for interpreting this UN declaration and assisting nations around the world uh, in implementing it. So I, ha I was very uh, in awe of him, and when he agreed to write the foreword, I knew I had to do a good job. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to do in this book lecture this evening is to cover uh, basically three areas with you. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, look at why or explain why I wrote this book about the UN Declaration. Secondly, I'd like to describe this UN Declaration for you. Um, has everybody, who has read this declaration? Raise your hand. By golly, that's a pretty substantial fraction. Um, but I want to uh, briefly describe this declaration, its principal features, and, and uh, the human rights framework that it creates for indigenous peoples, not only around the world, but here in the USA. And then thirdly, I would like to discuss some of the issues that are addressed in this book, some of my findings that I made, some of my uh, conclusions that I made from my comparative legal analysis, um, and especially uh, the, I want to talk about the need, the need to implement these UN standards in our own country here uh, into our US law and social policy and identify some of the implementation challenges that lie ahead for this generation. And I think after I cover these areas, uh, we'll have time, as, as mentioned, for questions and answers, and then I, I'll be available to sign a few books uh, after we're done here, um, thanks to the campus bookstore. Before I begin, though, I want to just sort of lay out the general premise of this book, and that is that this is truly a historic time for federal Indian law and policy. And of course, uh, federal Indian law is our current legal framework here in the US for defining Native American rights. That is our bundle of uh, legal rights as Native peoples, our political rights, our property rights, our cultural rights, and our civil rights as Native Americans. It's uh, defined by principles of federal Indian law. And we know very clearly that federal Indian law, it's been our experience in, during the modern era of federal Indian law, that this legal framework has basically two sides to it. On the one side, it has very protective features that are protective of Native American rights. I think it stems from or arises from the uh, tribal sovereignty, uh, inherent tribal sovereignty doctrine and the related uh, protectorate principles that were laid out by the Supreme Court in Wooster v. Georgia. And within these 
protective uh, features of federal Indian law.